All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's event on COVID-19 response um, documentation at the university. My name is Haven Spanier, and I'm the Senior Director of Programming at the University of South Carolina Alumni Association. And it's my pleasure to get to introduce our host today. But a couple of reminders before we get started. First, I'd like to thank Prisma Health for making this event possible. And I also want to remind you all that we're happy to have your questions today. So if you have any throughout the event, go ahead and type those either into the Q&A or the chat feature. If you aren't super familiar with Zoom, there should be a panel across the bottom of your screen that has a button for Q&A and for chat. Either one of those will work if you want to type those in. And then once the presentation concludes today, we will get to the question portion. Um, so feel free to, to put those in anytime during today's event. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce our host. Graham Duncan is currently Head of Collections and Curator of Manuscripts at the South Carolina Library, which is a special collections unit at U of SC dedicated to preserving and making available South Carolina related research materials. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in History and a Master of Library Science from U of SC and has been employed at the South Carolina Library since 2002 first as a student assistant, then as a full-time staff member, and now as faculty. So thank you so much, Graham, for joining us today. We're excited to hear from you. Thanks so much, Haven. Thanks for having me. And um, thanks to the Alumni Association for giving me an opportunity to talk a little bit about the work I do generally, and then more specifically kind of about this project um, that we've been running since last March. Um, so just kind of general overview, I'll, I'll kind of introduce myself a little bit and then the South Carolina Library. Um, some of you may not be familiar with exactly what we do, so I'll do kind of a little rundown of, of um, what we collect, what I do, and how the specific project documenting uh, COVID-19 at USC came about and fits in with our um, kind of general work at the library. I don't think it'll be too long, so there should be plenty of time for Q&A afterwards, hopefully. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. And we'll get started. Um, so as Haven said, my name is Graham Duncan. I'm the head of collections and the curator of manuscripts at the South Carolina Library. Um, so the South Carolina Library, um, it is one of the four special collections library units at uh, USC. So the other three being South Carolina Political Collections, the Urban Department of Rare Books and Special Collections, and Moving Image Research Collection, or MERC. Um, our library in its current form dates to 1940. Um, the historic building that we're generally located in on the Horseshoe was actually constructed in 1840. But for the first 100 years of that building's existence, um, it served as the primary college library. And then when McKissick uh, was completed in 1940 and became the library, um, the Caroliniana was founded and housed in the, the Caroliniana building on the horseshoe. And so just um, broadly speaking, uh, the term Caroliniana means things of and pertaining to Carolina. So our library's mission is to acquire, preserve, and make available for research um, South Carolina related materials of all kinds and from all periods. So that um, generally falls into four um, large collecting areas, uh, manuscripts, which I work with. Those are generally um, unpublished, so primary source materials. They tend to be family papers, so things like letters, diaries, um, that sort of thing. Also organizational records, so that could be anything from a church record, church records, um, garden clubs, book clubs, um, also business records, everything from kind of small country stores um, all the way up to large textile mills or department stores. Um, published materials is largely self-explanatory. That's chiefly books and monographs, 
uh, but also includes things like um, newspapers. We have a very large um, collection of, of both historic and contemporary South Carolina newspapers. Uh, we still subscribe to like all those little county papers and city papers that are published. Um, but also included in published materials are um, other kind of serials, um, maps, um, because they are published. And then visual materials, again, pretty self-explanatory. It's chiefly photographs and early photographic processes. So things like daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, stereographs, those types of things. Um, also a large postcard collection um, and then visual materials also contains uh, fine art, um, portraits of South Carolinians, and then design records, both architectural design and landscape design records. And then the fourth collecting area, which, which kind of um, contains materials that you may find in all the other three um, collecting areas, but, but is, is unique in itself is university archives. So the university archives are the official records of the university itself and university archives is, is based in um, the Caroliniana um, structure. And so that uh, those records are um, generally the large administrative offices on campus. So things like board of trustees, office of the president, office of the provost, um, other vice presidential offices, but also contains a, a variety of other materials like um, um, photographs of the university, particularly those taken by the university photographers and those sorts of things. So briefly kind of about my work as head of collections and curator of manuscripts, I do a lot of um, kind of what we term back of the house work. So I don't work um, with the research public a lot. Um, my work focuses on acquiring um, arrangement and description of newly acquired collections. So putting um, new collections into some sort of um, order to help researchers locate the material they need um, easier. And so that um, that involves processes that we call accessioning. So formally accepting the material, processing the material, again, arranging it and describing it in a way that, that makes sense for people. Um, preservation, which could be as simple as, as housing material in acid-free containers, folders, and boxes, um, all the way up to um, you know, coordinating with outside conservators and the USC Conservation Lab to do some more in-depth um, conservation work for, to ensure preservation. Um, I also help coordinate the digitization of our library's collections um, across all the, the collecting areas. We have a digital collections unit within um, university libraries. And so um, we, it's a, it's a small unit, but they, they do a lot of work, but it takes some um, coordination to, to make sure that we're getting the materials that folks want um, available online. I work a lot with potential collection donors to help um, transfer their materials to the Carolina. Those are, um, again, as with the manuscripts, they can range from individual people with family papers or their own papers, all the way up to um, businesses to help transfer their records to us. Um, in the time when we could do physical collections, both when we were in our own building and, and also when we could mount physical collections for large groups of folks to come look at, um, I did a lot of, of work, particularly with, with um, manuscript material to to display it and to, to write exhibit text for it. Um, we are currently planning a, a um, large opening exhibit for when the newly renovated South Carolina Library building opens, hopefully um, in about a year from now. So um, we're still actively working on, on exhibit material, though we don't, um, at this point, we're not actively um, displaying a lot of it. And then last but not least, I do a good bit of grant writing for everything from digitization projects to um, processing archivist projects to help um, arrange and describe collections that have come in. So a little bit of background on the specific project that I'm going to be talking about today, which is documenting COVID-19 at USC. Um, early on, 
in, when we transitioned to work from home last March, um, a group of us at the Carolinaana were approached by faculty at the Department of History here at USC um, about the need to um, to document uh, the the pandemic kind of as it unfolded. Um, we were, you know, we tossed around what the scope of the project may be, um, and and thought about doing it statewide since um, the Carolinaana does collect materials all about South Carolina from around the state, um, but ultimately ended up settling on um, uh, making sure that we could document the USC community, um, the responses of the, the university and the experiences of people within the USC community um, as a manageable project. And what we really, worked out with the folks at the Department of History and what they were very were really um, interested in making sure that were preserved were the personal experiences of, of folks. Oops. How do I go back? Sorry. <laughs> um, making sure that we preserve the personal experiences of folks within the U of SC community um, and with the pandemic. And we thought a lot about it in terms of the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, um, and how our, our discussions turn to how, while there is a lot of documentary evidence um, from the influenza pandemic of 100 years ago, a lot of that documentary evidence tends to come in the form of um, institutional records or governmental records. So things like the university um, and the state of South Carolina did a better job, um, frankly, at, at, at making sure that the records they produced survived. Um, but we don't have a lot of, of that personal, um, those personal experiences. So letters specifically describing the, the pandemic, um, photographs of, of you know, the effects of the pandemic, uh, diaries, that sort of thing. I mean, certainly some of that survives, but there is a, there is a gap there in the documentary record. So we were, we were particularly interested in making sure that we, um, that we were somehow able to collect materials that spoke directly to the personal experiences of folks. Um, as I said, we, we settled on what we thought was a manageable scope for the project, which would be um, documenting experiences of the USC community. And that's defined clearly as, as students, faculty, staff, but also um, the contract workers on campus, whether it be food service workers or, um, or other folks like that. Uh, we, we started a survey of similar projects that were emerging nationwide, and there were a lot of them, um, a lot of, of archives and libraries around the country and really around the world um, started up projects like this at about the same time. So that was really interesting to see kind of how we fit into it and, and um, really exchange some ideas with, with our colleagues around the the country um, to help develop this project, um, particularly folks at the uh, UNC Charlotte had a very early project going on um, that we we ended up modeling a lot of ours um, on stuff that they were they were doing as well. And so what we eventually um, decided that we wanted were born digital materials that were produced by members of the USC community official communications and policy updates from the university, and then a series of oral history interviews. So this project, because at the time that we started it, we were, we were all working from home um, and kind of physical contact with folks, potential donors um, was, was not, we weren't able to do that. Uh, we did decide to, at that point and, and continuing forward to limit the material that we collected to born digital material. And so born digital is just, you know, um, material that has never existed in a physical form. So, I mean, most of our documents today are, are produced and, and photographs are, are born digital um, items. So they've only existed digitally. Um, so again, the, those materials produced by members of the USC community would, um, would help document those personal experiences. But as I mentioned before, with university archives being a, um, a, a unit within the South Carolina Library, we were also kind of uniquely situated um, to work with, with our colleague, my colleague Elizabeth West, uh, the university archivist, um, 
to incorporate official communication and policy updates and those sorts of things into this um, project. And of course, she would be collecting this material anyway as part of the official records of the university. Uh, but this project would, would allow us to um, provide access to some of those materials in, um, in a way that, that maybe you know, folks generally you know, wouldn't, wouldn't think about accessing university records. Um, so it was it was a unique opportunity, I think, both to to do um, kind of what had been done with the, with the pandemic of 1918, which was you know ensure that institutional material survived and is accessible, and pair that with with material that spoke um, directly to the personal experiences. Um, University Libraries also has a department of oral history. Um, and, a, and a, a wonderful oral historian, Andrea Lumdu, and um, she came on board early on as one of the, the project team members as well, um, and really helped advise us with um, how to get uh, a oral history kind of component of this project launched. We reached out to folks across campus to serve as an advisory board to help guide this project. And that was a, that was a really, um, looking back on it, a really kind of key component of this, this project. Um, we really wanted to make sure that we were as inclusive and representative of um, the USC community as we could be. So um, we cast a pretty wide net for our advisory board. And I think it's, it's up to around 25 folks from around campus right now. Um, it includes um, all kinds of people. I mean, clearly the, the faculty members from the Department of History that first approached us were included among it, but also uh, folks from political science, um, education, nursing, a few different folks from uh, public health, but also um, non-academic faculty members to administrative folks um, that work in areas like housing. Um, the principal of Maxey College came on board as a as a uh, advisory board member. And really um, the folks from the Student Health Center. So really what we wanted the advisory board to do was to help uh, promote the project, put us in contact with folks who may be interested in sharing their materials, um, but also really um, help us connect with with folks who may want to to contribute oral history interviews or materials that we, we may not um, have kind of direct contacts with. And that's really been a, um, as I said, kind of a key component of this project is, is relying on the contacts around campus the members of the advisory board have um, to kind of broaden the scope of who we were able to reach with the project. Um, and like all of the work we do at the Carolinaiana, the ultimate goals of this uh, project were, were twofold, um, preservation and access. And, and that it's just keeping kind of directly with our, with our mission. Um, you know, so we, we receive these, these materials, these more digital materials, what, whatever they may be. Um, and the first job is to making sure that we can um, preserve these these materials in perpetuity so they're not only accessible now but but on into the future and then ultimately to provide access to these materials which is the part of the project we're we're really focusing on now um, and access will be provided through a through a website hosted by university libraries um, that will serve in some ways as an exhibit to show examples of materials but also as a as kind of a fully functioning collection website um, so folks can navigate their way through um, through the materials we collected. So we put all of those ideas together and um, we were lucky enough that the Office of the Vice President for Research early on in, in um, the work from home period uh, were offering a, a special funding opportunity for research um, into COVID-19. And um, so we applied for for that funding opportunity um, and, and ended up getting a successful grant of about $22,000 to, to really get this project off the ground. Um, I think they funded around 30 projects total from our, uh, um, throughout the university, but I believe that we were the only one that kind of had 
this this kind of humanities almost focus to it rather than a hard science or, or medical focus. Um, so we were really proud of that, that we were able to um, to approach, you know, an internal funding funding body and, and have them recognize the value <clears throat> of this project for for the university. Um, the money that we we received from the the grant largely went to paying a project archivist to to work um, kind of day to day on this project under my supervision. Um, so I didn't do as I was out kind of explain as we go. I didn't do kind of the nitty gritty day to day work on it, um, but but supervised a project archivist. Um, and then we also um, used some of the money for data storage, of course, and um, uh, for outside transcription of some of the oral history interviews that we did so that we can make those um, available um, sooner. All right, so what we're collecting and what we've been receiving, as I said, I mean, our, our, our focus um, on this was to really kind of try to elicit donations of, of material that, that document personal experiences of folks within the uh, USC community and it's really been amazing and interesting the types of material that we've the wide variety of materials I guess I should say that that we've been receiving um, I think we all expected you know to receive things like photographs and things like that of, of you know visual documentation of, of folks um, experiences and lives but the very first um, submission that we received actually was a set of was a, um, a collection of poems that someone that a student had written um, very early on in in transitioning to a kind of virtual learning experience um, so that was that was interesting and I think kind of set the tone for for the other types of materials that we've gotten um, we've received journal entries as people kind of um, you know and they may not be daily journal entries but just kind of uh, thought journals of, of folks, um, you know, I mean, just why I think wanting to get words on the screen, I guess, not on paper, um, thinking through kind of their life during during the pandemic. Um, we got the word out to um, some professors early on that we were doing this and particularly in that spring um, 2020 semester um, that was that was interrupted. Uh, quite a few professors assigned kind of um, year-end projects um, that focused on on students response to the semester response to the pandemic and um, quite a few of those those students ended up um, submitting their final you know essays for for inclusion in this project um, images of things and of course those can be um, you know digital photographs lots of digital photographs but also folks have got really creative and and submitted um you know either more digital artwork that they've created or photographed um, physical artwork that they created um, as a response to the to the pandemic and sent that to us as well um, video we we have gotten a few um a few different video submissions and again those range from kind of the very creative almost kind of you know film projects that folks were working on to um, to really practical ones um, we had, especially when I think about when campus um, reopened and some of us started coming back to work. Um, we had a colleague within the libraries who um, basically did kind of a, um, a vlog when he came back and so kind of a walk through <clears throat> of, of Thomas Cooper Library just pointing out things that had changed, um, you know, rearrangement of furniture, spacing, uh, plexiglass dividers, um, and then into his workspace to show kind of how, how that's changed and how his workflow has changed um, because of the pandemic, which was, I thought, a really kind of interesting um, take on how to document um, your personal kind of work experience um, um, on coming back. Uh, we do have some audio that goes beyond the oral history interviews. Um, we've gotten songs, people, you know, actually singing to us um, or about their, I guess not to us, but about the about their experiences. Um, and then we were also able to to preserve um, a series of podcast episodes that a student um, had recorded early on. Um, in, in the pandemic that really focused on, on students' mental health. Um, so 
they were they were um, kind enough to to send us the the audio files of that so that we can make sure we can preserve those. And then, of course, as I said, the oral history interviews. Um, I think we were we've conducted about twelve to date, and hope to do maybe um, ten or twelve more during this semester. And this just kind of gives you an idea of some of the um, some of the things we've asked folks during these these oral history interviews, um, and really what we wanted to. Um, to kind of focus on there was um, both their personal experiences. I mean, how is how is this, you know, outside maybe of the of the university and their their relationship with it? You know, how has this this affected their lives? And then also um, how it's affected their their professional life or or student your study here at the at the university. And the interview, the interviews we've done so far have largely been um, with members of um, faculty and administration within the university. And this semester, we're really hoping to focus on um, students, but also, um, as I mentioned, the the um, really the essential workers that many of us kind of that that really kept the university running during the pandemic. Um, so we've scheduled interviews with, with members of custodial staff and are actively working right now to, um, to talk with folks within food service as well, um, to make sure that those, that their experiences, which would be you know, fundamentally different than a, than a high level administrator or research faculty or teaching faculty or students would be, so. Just a little bit again. I mean, we're as I mentioned, we're doing this born digital. Um, it's not something that we had done a whole lot of before this project. Um, we have received born digital materials um, from folks, and I think particularly um, the university archivist has worked with with born digital materials and our visual image archivist, and both of them are on this project team. Um, we've received some born digital manuscript material, but not a lot. So there was kind of a learning curve with this. Um, but really what we realized with with things, um, particularly manuscript material, it's, this, it's kind of the same idea that we've always worked with, um, but just kind of a different method. So it's, it's receiving the material, arranging it in a way um, that makes sense to researchers, describing it in a way that they can um, find what they're looking for, and then, um, ensuring preservation and access um, and so that that um, metadata kind of block there that's our that's the term for um, kind of descriptive data about about digital materials that we've received so the data about data um, and like i said we're we're really ensuring preservation and access so to do that um, we basically um, we we copy and, and make a new version of the um, the original submitted file so that we can put the original file into kind of a deep um, digital storage where, where it won't be touched or accessed. Um, that way we can ensure pre preservation of that file. And then the access copy is what we actively work with and then which will ultimately be um, viewed by the research public. And so kind of to wrap up, this portion of it, um, just give you a sample kind of of some things that we've that we've received with this um, through this project. Um, there on the left is a is a kind of a word cloud that I think it was a class project um, they kind of put together um, or, mm, as they they transitioned to study from home uh, and then submitted to us. Um, articles that folks have written, um, we're, we're actively kind of take, collecting those as we can get them. Um, and then I said, like I said, lots of photographs and, and these are um, two nursing students actually, and this was taken actually not in Columbia, um, but after they returned um, home, all, to their off campus home um, and, and were working uh, within the COVID unit of, of a local hospital. Um, there again, on the left is, are some of um, poetry that we've received. Um, another 
another um, nurse working in in a hospital, um, kind of in their their protective gear, and then somebody snapped a photo of of the cocky statue there with us, uh, there on campus, and sent it to us. He's got his mask on there, telling people to stay home. Um, kind of finish up. This is just a screenshot of the the landing page that we have right now for the project um, and the submission form. So we put this together pretty early on just to to get it out there, just to let people know what we're doing, um, kind of what types of materials we're looking for. And then there on the right on the tell your story bar is the, the actual link to the submission form for the material. And basically we're, it's just a Microsoft form. Um, we collect some information from the folks themselves to, to make sure we know what we have, you know, who was the creator of this object, you know, when was it, when was it created, you know, some, some sort of description of it, and then they can upload the file directly there on that submission form. Um, we can, I think we can accept up to 10 files at a time or up to a gigabyte uh, limit, but we can always accept multiple, multiple submissions. So, um, and this this website is linked off of the South Carolina Libraries um, um, site on, on USC, and the, the address is there at the bottom. But when you go to the to the Carolina site, you'll see a, a bar over to the right for this project. So that's really kind of all I have. Um, but I'm happy to take some time now. I think we have at least a half hour or so to, to talk some about it or um, answer any questions that you might have. It looks like we have a couple of questions. So the first one I'll read to you is, what has been the most challenging part of keeping up with all of the COVID-19 information? And on the other hand, what has been the most interesting part? Um, I think, you know, one of the, one of the early challenges we had was just to make sure that we set up a workflow, um, to be able to collect all the information that was coming out, particularly from the university. Um, and that workflow was really, um, put together by the project archivist assigned and the university archivist, um, to, to make sure that they were in, in close coordination with each other, um, to get the materials that are coming out and um, to the project archivist, you could then convert them into, into what we needed to, um, to save. Um, of course, a lot of that um, kind of information that was coming out was just done on websites. And when we started this project, we, we didn't have a really great way of, um, of preserving websites um, in real time. Um, there are some products out there that we're, we're looking into now with, with this experience in mind, a product called Archivit, um, primarily that can document, um, that basically does a crawl through websites and, and documents every version of it. Um, so we, we had to do that in kind of a, a manual way to go in and, and check websites periodically um, from different units on campus and the main one and, and convert those websites into PDFs and save them that way. Um, not the most elegant solution, but one that one that worked. So that was kind of one of the, the early challenges. And then, and it's been a challenge for archives around the country for, for probably, I guess, going on a decade now, but years um, documenting social media. It's just, it's really hard. Um, to, to do that in a way in an automated way. And I mean, we can't we can't, our project artifacts can't spend all of her time, um, you know, scrolling social media and, and then contacting folks to get their permission to um, include it in this project. Um, so we've, we've asked folks and we have received um, like screenshots of social media um, posts and things like that and memes folks have created. Um, but that was also, um, continues to be a, a challenge um, and that's not unique to to us um, lots of libraries have experienced the challenge of trying to die, trying to archive social media I mean, um, it was a fairly famous example with the library of congress trying to uh, archive twitter a number of years ago and, and i'm not sure that project is is continuing but uh, interesting one um, and then as far as kind of the most interesting 
part of it. I think it's just really how I would say maybe how um, folks have really thought creatively about documenting their experiences and really sent us um, types of submissions and types of material that maybe we didn't even realize that they would early on. Um, I think, you know, at the Carolinaana, at least we're, we're very used to working with, with documents, um, photographs, that sort of thing. Um, but really kind of um, how folks yeah, like I said, kind of thought creatively and outside of the box and sent us things like like film projects and um, poetry and things like that. So that's, it's been interesting to see how folks um, have interpreted uh, documenting their experiences because I mean, you know, our, our side of the project is simply to make sure the material survives as archivists. Um, you know, we'll leave it to future researchers to decide, you know, exactly how this material can be used or interpreted. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, the um, creativity shown by, by some of the donors has been really interesting. All right, how do you think that our university's COVID experience has been different from some of the other schools that you looked at when you were trying to figure out what to document? Well, I mean, I, I don't know, honestly, to answer that. Um, I mean, when we were looking at this project, it was, you know, mid-March and, and we were just, we were just getting um, kind of started thinking about documenting things, um, you know, I mean, from what we were able to see on other um, universities project that they were running, I think we're getting, you know, fairly similar um, material. But I don't know, you know, at this point, I don't, I don't really know how USC's experience may, may stack up against some of these, some of these other places. Um, sorry. After you've spoken with students and received some of their submissions, have you seen kind of a similar response from students or people's reactions to being a student during the pandemic just all across the board? Yeah, I think they've been fairly, um, yeah, I mean, fairly similar. I mean, I think, you know, in, in the ways they can be, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks are kind of thinking hard about about what it means to transition to virtual learning um, when they never thought they would had to have to. Um, there was a lot of response, I think, to leaving campus for spring break and then not coming back. Um, that was a fairly sad decision, and I think a lot of folks kind of thought about it that way. So, what we ended up getting, especially early on, was was a lot of material that documented um, not folks not on campus, but but um, away from campus. Um, but that said, there were, and we knew early on that it was something that we needed to work, work on, work on, work with, um, and we did. I mean, there were, there were also a group of students that didn't go home and that stayed on campus the entire time. Um, and, and the group of international students that were here, um, they had a completely unique experience um, in compared with, with some of the folks from from in state or or in the country, um, so so some of the the um, material that they've that they've um, submitted is is you know fundamentally different than folks that were not on campus. So we got you know from their perspective photos of of campus immediately, kind of after the closure, that sort of thing. Um, and then we're we're actively working right now to schedule um, to make sure that we get at least at least one um, perspective from an international student in an oral history interview, um, but hopefully, hopefully more. Cool, yeah, I'm sure international students definitely had a different response and experience. Yeah. Um, next question is, even after the majority of South Carolinians and students have been vaccinated and we someday return to a version of pre-COVID life, do you think all will continue? Do you think you all will continue to collect info on the pandemic? Yeah, yeah, we fully intend to. Um, the funding for this project is, is officially um, up at the end of April. So, you know, the, the 
what we've collected so far will be live um, and available for use then. Um, but yeah, I fully expect to to at least keep the submission form open and to keep keep telling folks about about the project. Um, because what I mean, I think you know there there will probably be people that have material that documented their experiences during this year, year and a half, whatever it turns out to be, um, where we've really seen the disruption in our lives that maybe just they haven't heard about the project yet so they can contribute that material. But, you know, if we look at this broadly as as the effects of the pandemic on the USC community and the university's um, response to it, I mean, I think those are, that will be with us for, for years, if not forever. I mean, I, you know, I mean, we'll be, we'll be, in, you know, at least in some way thinking about and dealing with the effects of the pandemic and in the university's response. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I fully intend to to keep this project going as we as we can, um, you know, without a dedicated archivist on it. Um, it'll just have to kind of fall to to some of the rest of us to to keep keep the work going. But yeah, I mean, I, we'll keep, we'll keep continue we'll continue to collect materials and, and add them to the to the website as long as as long as folks are submitting them. So even though student a lot of students came back to campus this fall and then this spring semester, have you gotten any documentation from students who chose to stay home and do completely virtual school this academic year? I don't know. Um, I'm just trying to think. I don't, I don't know that we've gotten anything, at least that specifically kind of um, references that or mentions that. I mean, there very well may be submissions that have come from folks that are doing that, but um, but I don't know anything off the top of my head um, like that. Since the return to campus, the majority of stuff that we've gotten from from folks is documenting their return to campus, um, and it tends to be a lot of, of, and which I think is really interesting and really important because I'm not sure that anybody else is doing it. But um, photographic documentation of just the changes around campus, um, like those hand washing stations that are everywhere, we've gotten a number of kind of framed framed shots of a hand. Not, I mean framed but but shots of a hand washing station you know in front of a particular building behind it um, which I think are, are neat um, and then very recently um, we don't have examples yet we're still working to make sure that we have that we can we can add them to them but we received a, a large set of photographs from um, the College of Nursing um, from I think it was a student assignment actually where where they went and volunteered at the um at the prisma vaccination center um so that that's been been really interesting kind of coming back but yeah to your original question i can't think of anything um that specifically references students who, who chose to stay um, all virtual so we talked a lot about the student response um to the pandemic but what has been Kind of the general response of faculty and staff. Um, I mean, it's a lot of um, from teaching faculty. Um, it was kind of we got a variety of things. I mean, folks um, kind of step by step on how they went through and and you know a week or two and fully transitioned to a um, virtual teaching environment. Um, so what that looks like and how you know in the middle of a semester they had to you know if it's a if it you know their original syllabus and then their new one um, and how that how that kind of affected their teaching which I think is interesting um, one of the advisory board members and somebody we work closely with teaches the history of higher education here at USC so um, he I think was particularly interested in in making sure that um, kind of the nuts and bolts changes to um, to faculty life and teaching faculty life making sure those things were documented um, and then other faculty we've spoken with to um, for oral history interviews. I mean, we we wanted to make sure that we um, that we interviewed um, like the chair of faculty senate, and so all of the to because I mean they were really um, they worked hard and a lot, and there was a lot of debate and discussion about um, you know what these kind of 
changes meant to um, to faculty governments, governance to grading um, and all of that sort of stuff. So, so there's a nice oral history um, interview with the with the chair of faculty senate that touches on a lot of of kind of the issues that that the whole faculty were were thinking about and and talking about um, kind of higher level. Um, and then other faculty and staff, like I said, kind of like the staff member at at the library that documented the changes to their um, to their work environment. Um, we've we've gotten a good bit of that. Um, of, of, yeah, just just kind of photographs or or um, of how how folks you know offices have changed that sort of thing or or their workspaces. Okay, this one um, says that it's really fascinating to hear about all the different multimedia documentation submissions that you all have received and what has been maybe your favorite form to receive or maybe a favorite submission that really encompasses what's been happening. Um, I don't know that I have a kind of a favorite, but thinking about kind of multimedia um, part of the question and, and somewhat of the uniqueness, um, there was kind of a, um, one of the, the film professors at USC, um, kind of their end of the semester project is always a, a short film. Um, and they had a number of students that, that did those um, kind of around the, the pandemic and, um, and campus. And so, we, we got a couple of, of interesting um, kind of artistic short films um, documenting documenting people's experience, um, which were which were really unique. Um, and and you know, I'm sure all of you know every semester they get kind of really interesting end of the year submissions like that. But I, I you know I thought it was really neat to be able to see some of those that were were particularly. Um, Kind of dedicated to to folks, you know, and they and they weren't, you know, necessarily um, documentary type things around campus, but but really kind of centering on on um, students' kind of thoughts and experiences themselves. And so those were those were really interesting. I look, I look forward to being able to put those up and and have folks, um, you know, think about the the you know pandemic through through art, um, which is which is Kind of different, I think, than how most of us, and at least how I, as, as an archivist and, and somewhat historian, kind of think about documenting um, historical periods. Cool. I'd be interested to see those videos for sure. All right. Well, it looks like we've gotten through all of the questions, unless anyone has some last minute questions they want to type in really quick. But Thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope you learned a lot about the documentation process. Thank you to Prisma Health again for making this event possible. And big thank you, Graham, for coming on and sharing all of this information and experience with us. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad to um, be able to do this. And of course, anybody that has a, has a connection to the university community, um, that wants to wants to submit material, feel free to um, the website's linked off of the Carolina site. So. Great, thank you so much. Everyone right. have a wonderful day. Thank you.